Hello and welcome to today's workshop on helping veterans become quality suppliers. As we get started, we'd like to thank our sponsors, Comcast, the City of San Jose, International Line Builders, the California Department of General Services, the California Water Association, AT&T, and the nationwide network of our elite SDVOB. And a little housekeeping. You should have a worksheet to complete during this workshop. If you haven't done so already, find the link that allows you to download it and download it so you can answer the questions and complete the worksheet during the workshop itself. We're going to take a couple of breaks to allow you to complete each section and during the breaks you'll be able to ask questions and we're going to handle them then in the middle of the presentation and at the end. Today's presentation is based on the Awakened CEO system which is a balanced and comprehensive approach to business growth on multiple levels. In that system, we talk about the seven different key performance areas of business, leadership, sales, service and delivery, marketing, product development, operations and administration, and financial management. And today's workshop is focused on leadership. And it's focused on two different audiences, the veteran suppliers themselves and the companies who hire them. Let's take a look at the business survival problem. Here in the United States, way too many business owners fail. They fail to create a successful business or they fail to create the business of their dreams. It's actually very difficult to tell how many businesses fail. Some people will tell you that the success rate of businesses is 50% over the first three years. Some people will say that it's only 10%. And it really depends on what you consider to be a success. There's a lot of businesses that start and never get on anybody's radar screen because they never file corporate paperwork and they never pay taxes, and especially if they don't pay any employment taxes and they don't hire any employees, the states may not even know that they exist at all. I personally think that the success rate of businesses in America is probably only 10% or even less, especially if you consider the part-time stay-at-home businesses where people just dabble and spend a few hundred dollars without committing to it full time, only to find out that it's much more difficult than they thought that they were going to be. The biggest reason that businesses fail is because they're ill-prepared. They don't get the training they need before or after they start the business. They take the job without knowing what the job is, so they make a lot of mistakes that slow them down or shut them down. One of my colleagues used to say that success in business wasn't really so much a matter of what you did right, but a matter of what you avoided doing wrong. That businesses, when they start out, make a whole bunch of $5,000 mistakes and $10,000 mistakes and $1,000 mistakes. And the more mistakes that they can avoid making, the longer they will have to actually become a success. The more that, that little nest egg that they had will last them because they didn't blow it by doing something that they shouldn't have been doing in the first place. The best study that I can see was done by the University of Tennessee in 2012, where they said that 76% of business failures over a period of three years were due to management incompetent or inexperience. The biggest reason is because the job doesn't turn out to be what people think it will be. People go into business all the time thinking that the job is going to be what they love to do. They think that because they're a good painter, they'll be able to run a good painting business and that they know that there's some other little stuff that they have to do, but they really think the job is painting and they're really good at painting, so they don't think that they have any experience gaps or knowledge gaps. They're often surprised to find out that the job of running a painting business may only be 30 or 40 percent being a good painter. The rest of it is all that other stuff that you have to do. All of those other key performance areas of business, the leadership, the marketing, the sales, the financial management, the product development, all of that other stuff which may actually consume 60 or 70 percent of your time or even more. And in the early days of business, when they don't have any painting jobs and don't have any painting customers at all, they don't get to do what they love to do and what they're best at at all. And they're oftentimes surprised to find out that the job of running a painting business, for example, doesn't have a thing to do with painting in the early days of business. It's all about marketing and sales and creating a great business model. And so we have a challenge. The challenge is twofold. The first one is preparation and support. 
making sure that business owners are prepared for the challenges of their business and they get the support that they need, and really understanding what skills and experiences they need to be successful in their particular chosen business. The good news is that there's some models that we can look at that are very successful, that when we apply them to small businesses, we can dramatically improve the success rate of those businesses. Let's first think about the way that top companies hire. Now, if you were to seek a job at, say, one of our sponsoring companies, AT&T or Comcast or International Line Builders, what I think we would see in their onboarding, recruiting, hiring process is something like this. They would have a job description that completely and accurately defined the job that they wanted to hire somebody to do. They would review a series of applications to make sure that the application was consistent with the job description. They would have a lot of interviews with great questions, and the best companies out there will insist on multiple interviews by multiple people at different times of the day. Uh, sometimes they actually want to do interviews outside of the hiring department so that somebody can give a completely objective perspective on that particular candidate. But anyway, they have lots of interviews with lots of great questions. They do backgrounds and reference checks whenever somebody passes the interview process. And then they typically do probationary hiring. They will typically give somebody a contract but it's, or an employment engagement, but it's fairly well known that you know, if something happens in the first 90 days or so, then both parties may decide to sever that particular relationship. I think everybody knows that when they go to work for a new company that they really are kind of on probation for the first 90 days or so. Then they give them great training and mentoring with a great onboarding process designed to help them understand the company culture, designed to help them get integrated with the team in which or with which they will work, designed to help them understand the business and understand the specific details of the job that they are hired to do. We surround them with a great team. We give them ongoing management to help ensure their success. And we give them advancement by performance, making sure that we don't put them in a job that they are unqualified to do. As it turns out, the military in the United States has a very similar process. They also have well-defined job descriptions. They have qualification tests. They do background checks on people who want to join the military. They have a 12-week boot camp, typically, with lots of training. And they have entry-level positions with lots of mentoring. They have ongoing management. They're surrounded by incredible teams. And they only get promotion and advancement based on tests and education. Let's contrast both of those with the way that businesses are started in America today. First, there's no job description. In many cases, people start a business without even knowing what the business is. Secondly, they don't have anyone to objectively review their, quote, application or their fitness for running a particular business. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Oftentimes, they just get encouragement and support. It seems like everybody is a cheerleader and nobody's an umpire. If they go to the local chamber of commerce and say, hey, I want to start a particular business, the chamber of commerce, I can almost guarantee you, is going to give them a lot of encouragement. And oh, by the way, one of the things that they can do to really help their success is to, is to get a membership in the local chamber of commerce. If they go to a training organization, an entrepreneurial support organization, they're most likely going to get encouragement and, again, an offer to buy the particular products and services of that organization. Almost no one wants to tell a business owner that they should wait for a few months or even a few years to go get the level of experience that they really need to be successful in the business that they want. And they do that because they either want their business or nobody wants to discourage anybody. You know, even a blind squirrel will find an acorn from time to time, and no one wants to be that person who discourages somebody from pursuing their dreams. So consequently, no one objectively reviews their, quote, application to jump into business. They typically don't get any interviews. Nobody's really talking to them about the job uh, and about their fitness for doing that particular job. There's no reference checks. They might have probationary hiring if they choose to do it for themselves. 
So they may decide to take on a job part-time for a few months, or they may decide to dabble for a few months before jumping into it full-time, but that's not the way that most people do it. Most people just jump off the diving board into the deep end of the pool and decide that they're going to try to learn to swim you know, on the way down before they hit the water. There's typically no formal onboarding process. They may have self-selected training and mentoring. The really smart ones will go out and get a business coach or business consultant, people who are members of their team that can help them in those early stages of business, but it's not required and many people do without. They can self-select a team, but all too often people decide to be solo entrepreneurs. They decide that they're gonna give it a go alone because you know, they don't have the money and they don't have the experience necessary to really hire a quality team. And then they have no ongoing management. Nobody will actually come in on a quarterly basis or a monthly basis or every single week and review their performance and give them the feedback that they really need to be successful in their business. And all too often, and one of the ones that really upsets me the most, is they self-promote before they even have proven performance. I've seen dozens of people, dozens of prospective business owners, go to a business conference or some sort of a workshop where they're inspired to create a business that's way beyond their experience. They may say, I want to start a landscaping business, and somebody says, no, you don't want to start a landscaping business. You want to start a landscaping empire. It's you just don't want to do it by yourself. You want to hire a team and you just don't want to hire one team. You want to hire a bunch of teams to go out and dominate the marketplace. We're sure that you can do that. So they oftentimes will get the encouragement of other people to start a business that's way beyond their experience level, maybe even way beyond their funding capacity. They promote themselves before they're really ready to take on the challenges of a larger business. So let's take a look at those three different approaches lined up side by side. In corporate America, they have job descriptions, interviews, tests and checks, probationary hiring, onboarding and training, great management, you're surrounded by a high performing team, you have good training and mentoring in your career, and you only get advancement by performance. The same in the military, but is absolutely not true in small businesses. No job descriptions, no interviews, no tests and check, maybe some probationary hiring, maybe some onboarding and training if the business owner chooses to do it for themselves. Typically, nobody to come in and manage them and tell them how they're really doing. They may or may not have a team. They may or may not get a training or mentoring, and they may or may not get advancement by performance. So corporate America enjoys an 85% or greater success rate. The military also has an 85% or better success rate. In 2006, the Air Force only had a 7.1% washout rate from their boot camps. They did really good. Almost 93% of all of the people who were accepted into the Air Force made it through their boot camp process. But small businesses much less than 50%. And it, as I mentioned earlier, I think it may be less than even 10% of success. And these are the primary reasons because there's just no training, no education, no ongoing mentoring, and no management. The second part of the challenge is understanding what skills and experiences the business owners need to be successful. One of my favorite books is called Investing in Entrepreneurs, A Strategic Approach for Strengthening Your Regional and Community Economy by Greg Lichtenstein and Tom Lyons, both PhD from the Wharton School of Business. In this book, the authors take a look at the complexity of different types of businesses relative to the experience of the business owners and what they found just now seems like common sense to me. That if somebody has very little experience, it would be a good idea for them to have a very simple business. And it's only the people with a significant amount of business experience that should try to run very complex businesses. And of course, in the middle, then people with a moderate amount of experience can run a reasonably complex business. If you take somebody with a lot of business experience and suggest that they run a very simple business, they're not gonna be satisfied. They're gonna get bored. They're just gonna hang it up after a while. And if you take a rookie in business and ask them to run a very complex business, they're going to make a lot of mistakes and they're going to give up too. So all veteran businesses are not the same. 
Businesses vary in complexity themselves, and entrepreneurs don't have the same level of experience and talent. Each business has its own business complexity profile and its business complexity score. As we look to support veteran businesses, what we see is that not all veterans are the same. So a big difference between somebody who went to college and went into the service for four to six years, and then they got out early in their career, they may only be 28, 29, 30 years old, and they're willing to start a very small business. That's not the same as a veteran who retires after 30 years in the service and then wants to start on her career. And it's not the same whether somebody is you know, in a combat organization or somebody who works in logistics. So somebody who's used to working in an office environment in the service will have a much different perspective and a much different skill set when it comes to running a business in a white collar environment when they get out of the service. After having looked at several hundred businesses, I created this little concept called a business complexity profile. And I'll apologize if you can't read this. I know the printing is really small. What this basically shows is that there are a lot of different types of business that have different complexity. We give each business a complexity score in each one of the seven key performance areas of business. So a business where you're selling roses by the corner is extremely simple business. And if you're bringing a new medical device to market or you're bringing a a new pharmacy product to the market, it is an extremely complex business because of the varying complexity factors in each one of these different areas of business. Let's dig into that for a few moments. First, what is a complexity factor? Complexity factors are things that take special skills, that take a lot of time, that cost a lot of money, that might be tough emotionally to do, that might carry a lot of risk. Leadership complexity might involve the size of a company, a very large company requires better leadership skills than a very small company. If a company has layers of management, it requires more leadership. If a company is dealing with unions, it requires a lot more leadership because it makes it a much more complex thing to do. Government contracts are influenced because of the regulations and the undependability in funding can add to the complexity of the leadership area of business. The overall performance of a business matters. It's much easier running a business that is profitable than it is running a business that is not. And the stage of growth matters as well. It's much easier running a business that is experiencing steady growth than it is a business that's say in the startup mode or in the turnaround mode or even a business that's experiencing explosive growth. In the marketing area of business, complexity factors include competitive pressures. Always more difficult to run a business when there's lots of competition than running one when there's very little competition. If you're in a rapidly changing industry, it makes it difficult to market to that industry. Life and death products are difficult to market. Entering new markets can be a big marketing challenge. E-marketing, digital marketing can be a huge marketing challenge. And there are some markets that are much more challenging than other markets for a wide variety of reasons. In sales, complexity factors include the length of a sales cycle. It takes a lot more funding and a lot more sales expertise whenever you have a very long sales cycle. The number and size of transactions matters a lot. If you have a lot of very small transactions, that can make sales very easy. If you have a small number of very large transactions, that can make sales very difficult indeed. Compensation plans can add to the complexity of the business. Whether or not you actually sell through partners and have channel programs adds to the complexity. And the scope of your operations, whether they're just local or they're actually national or global, can add to the complexity of your sales operations. In financial management, some of the complexity factors include cash flow. If cash flow is a challenge at your business, that makes the business a lot more complex, as do complex credit terms. And again, the size and the quantity of the transactions. While having a large number of very small transactions can make it easy on sales, it can make it very difficult when it comes to financial management. The size of the company matters too. Large companies typically will have greater financial management complexity than small companies. And if a company is raising capital, then financial management can be complex indeed. 
In operations and administration, some of the complexity factors include the size of the inventory and the number of parts that you have in the inventory. If you have a complex product, that makes operations and administration more complex. The number of locations that you have and the necessity for legal compliance can make a company much more complex. And information systems, and especially whether or not you have any ecological or toxic product issues, can all add to the complexity in the operations and administration areas of your business. In product development, Complexity factors include rapidly changing technology and product complexity. If you have a long design cycle, that can add to the complexity of a company as well, and the required R&D investment can add to the complexity of a business. And finally, in the area of customer service, product complexity and the anxiety of your customer base can really add to the number of challenges that you see. So for example, if you're providing services to small business owners, to startup business owners, where the job can be very complex and the customer base itself can be very anxious, you can have a lot of customer service issues. If your product itself is prone to have a lot of quality control issues, that will increase the complexity of your customer service department. And actually the number of customers increases the complexity too. So when you take a look at all of those different complexity factors and you match them up with all of the different types of businesses that there are, you can see that there is a wide variation in the business complexity profile. Let's take a look at a couple of them in detail. First, a hot dog stand that I give a business complexity profile rating of 13 to. Self-motivation is essential, but generally you have no employees, so leadership really isn't a big problem. As it turns out, location is everything. You don't have to worry about marketing very much. There's no lead generation. You can have a lot of repeat customers. If you set up a hot dog stand right outside a bus station, you're gonna find a lot of people passing you by every day. And essentially, all you have to do is deliver a great product at a fair price. You don't have to have a lot of marketing expertise or sales expertise. You may not have a lot of direct competition. It's a very impulse sales. Hey buddy, would you like a hot dog? And it's very easy to provide service. It's a strictly cash business, so there's no credit problems or really cash flow issues. You have very little inventory and very little shrinkage. It's a simple business to run. Having a hot dog stand outside a bus station or a train station or where there's lots of people gathering around who are hungry on their lunch hour, on the way to work, on the way from work, you know, you can have a successful business with a hot dog stand and not really understand business very much at all. On the other hand, if you're a prime government contractor, I give that business a complexity profile score of 37, nearly three times the complexity of somebody who's running a hot dog stand. In fact, being a prime government contractor is one of the most complex businesses that there are. There are long and expensive sales cycles, very tough competition. The contracts themselves can be extremely challenging and unfortunately funding can be pulled at any moment. For example, here in California, we found that funding for the new high-speed rail system, which was originally planned to go from Los Angeles to San Francisco, was pulled when we elected a new governor. The regulations can be tough, the paperwork can be tough, and you have very complex supplier relationships. So as many of you listening to this today know that being a prime government contractor and even being a consultant to or a service provider to a prime government contractor can make it a very complex business. So I invite you to think about those two things as we take a break now. Think about business complexity factors. Think about the preparation that most businesses do not get when they first start up their business. And if we're going to answer a few questions and then we're going to come back in the second half of our program and talk about what we can do about it. All right, we've got a few questions now over part one. Here's the first question. Why don't we train people on becoming business owners in high schools and colleges? I think that's a great question and I'm on kind of a personal mission to make sure that high school students and college students have that kind of training available to them. I think the best way of looking at that is that the current educational system, the public education system in the United States, was designed specifically to train people to be better employees. When the Industrial Revolution came around in the mid-1800s, 
uh, public schools in states started becoming mandatory, I think it was in about 1850 or so, that uh, because the industries out there wanted people to be trained, they wanted people to be able to read and write, they wanted the people to be able to communicate well, they wanted basic math skills, they wanted people to have a little bit of perspective so that they could become good employees. What we see in large colleges today, like Stanford and MIT and other ones, will have entrepreneurial training programs and at a master's level they will have great business school programs but those programs are specifically designed to make people great leaders at very very large organizations what we don't see is any public education that helps people become great owners of small businesses where they've got two or three or five employees micro businesses really don't have any public education options at all. So I think the bottom line is, you know, we as a society have not pushed on public education systems to offer that kind of small business owner training as much as we could to facilitate people being, being successful in small businesses. Here's another question on what are some good sources of training? We're going to talk about good sources of training a lot more in the second half of our program. But in general, there are a lot of good training out there. You can the, the SBA has a couple of different programs with the small business development centers and their SCORE programs. You can look up online for free training and education for small businesses. And there's a lot of it out there. I know I've got uh, over 100 hours of free training and education available on my particular website. But the challenge there is that people don't have time a lot of times to get the education and training that they need in general. I saw an analogy just a couple of days ago that said that starting a business is like jumping off of a cliff and building your airplane on the way down and trying to learn to fly it before you crash at the bottom of it. You know, and how, how high the cliff is really depends on how deep your pocketbook is. So people generally jump off into business before they got the right education and then they're only looking for very specific training without having the general education and the foundational knowledge that they needed to be able to apply that training successfully in business. So my belief is that people actually need a training coordinator is what they really need in business. They need somebody that can come in and say, this is the training that you need right now to do what you need to do in the next 90 days of your business. You need sales training. You need marketing training. You need training in reading financial statements. You need all kinds of general training, but specific to do the job that's right at hand for you. Next question. Why are some people successful and others are not? And oh boy, that is the million dollar question. I think that there's a couple of different answers to that. Number one is something we get from the United States Marine Corps. I love the Marine Corps' admonition to improvise, adapt, and overcome. They have very great plans for every single mission that they have, but they also teach their people and teach them well that no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy, that you have to be prepared to improvise, to, to adapt and overcome. So people who are successful in business are those who are very resilient and who have great resourcefulness, that they have a demonstrated pattern of facing challenges and overcoming those challenges, as opposed to those people who come from corporate America and just have a plan and they execute that plan, but there's no real challenges to executing that plan. Resilience and resourcefulness, I think, is the number one deciding factor as to whether or not somebody's going to be successful in business. And the second one I'll just point out there is their team approach. You know, do they have the approach that, hey, I'm going to do this all myself? You know, that I want all of the glory to say that I, I run this business, I started this business, or are they going to be humble and have a team approach and recognize that there are some things that they just flat don't know how to do and don't, and don't want to do and really think from the very beginning that they're going to hire a team and reward their team and act more like a coach to their team than, you know, a high profile quarterback. Um, you know, when you're, when you're running a business, it's not the same as being like the star of the movie or being, 
you know, the only person on the team who actually shoots the ball. When we take a look at, at sports, we take a look at people like Michael Jordan or LeBron James in basketball. You know, they were successful. They won championships because they made everybody around them be better. So having a team approach and being resilient and being resourceful, I think, are huge success factors when it comes to small business. We got time for one more question here in this first part of the of the presentation today. And here it is. It says, I've never heard of business complexity profile before, and how do I determine my profile and my particular complexity factors? Well, probably the reason why you haven't heard of the business complexity profile before is because I made it up. And the reason I made it up is because I've seen hundreds of businesses. As it turns out, having the perspective that I've got of having 50 years of business experience and having been a business coach and consultant for 18 years and having worked with literally hundreds of different businesses out there, you know, that's pretty rare. You can't get 50 years of business experience overnight. It takes 50 years to get that experience. So it really takes that, that perspective of having worked with a lot of different businesses across a lot of different industries before you even begin to realize that there is such a thing as varying complexities to the businesses and have a chance to actually build business complexity profile. So how do you determine what your complexity is? I think you can take a look at this presentation again and go through the complexity factors that we listed for the last you know, 10 minutes or so leading up to this break and judge it for yourself. But my encouragement would be for you to get somebody on your team, a management consultant, a business consultant, that can help you understand what the most critical success factors are in your business and what you really need to focus on in order to be successful in your business. We're gonna take just a small break right now. And when we come back, we're gonna talk a lot more about what we can do about success factors in business, how we can build better quality veteran suppliers in just a minute. Welcome back to the second half of our presentation today on quality veteran suppliers. Uh, in the first half of our presentation, we talked about the challenges that small businesses face, especially veterans, when they want to become suppliers. And now we're going to talk a little bit about what we can do about it. So let's talk about that for a second. I think the probability of survival and growth of veterans running small businesses will dramatically improve if they get very clear on their business, if they develop great plans, if they see their gaps and get to the appropriate training that they need, and they're surrounded by a great team and they get early support and they stay focused during the execution of their business plans. I'm going to take a look at each one of those different areas independently here for the next few minutes to give you a little food for thought. And I encourage you to fill out your worksheet as we're going through. First, I think it's very important for business owners to get very clear on their business. They should have a vision of the business that they want to create and understand the why and the purpose of their business. And that's how I define the word mission. Actually, mission has a couple of different definitions to it. One of them is the military definition that has a very clear and measurable objective and the other definition of a mission is around the purpose or the calling of the business. So I think that business owners need to get clear on all of those things. Having a vision of the business that they want to create, understanding exactly what that means and what it means to be successful in their mission of creating a business, and in the why. Why are they doing this in the first place? Is it because they don't want to have a boss? Is it because they want to be creative? Is it because they want a chance at incredible wealth? I mean, really understanding the why of their business. And in this getting clear on the business, they should get clear on the challenges and the complexity factors that we talked about in the first half of this presentation. Be very clear on the value that they're bringing to their customers, the competition that they are facing, their uniqueness in the marketplace. Um, I oftentimes find when I work with business owners that they're not clear on these things. It's really fuzzy in their head. So the very first thing that we do when we engage with the clients is to make sure that they're going through a business clarity process and getting very clear on the business that they want to create, the status of where they are today, and the immediate plans that they have. And speaking of that, next thing is to create a great plan. 
A great plan contains the growth strategy of the business, what they're going to do first, what they're going to do next, what they're going to do after that, with both long-term goals and short-term goals. They should have a market penetration strategy when they're first starting up their business and whenever they're bringing new products to market or they're pursuing new marketplaces. They should have a financial and funding strategy, a staffing strategy, and a product development strategy, and all kinds of different strategies. In investor-grade business plans, they might be a 40 to 45 pages long. They'll have some information about the market and the industry. They'll have all of these different sections. They'll have a lot of appendices that show a lot more information on the business. But whether or not somebody creates an investor-grade business plan or not and actually writes this down in a formal manner, it's real important for them to at least have scratched it out on paper, to really think it through a little bit before they leap into business itself. Third thing that's really important is that they really understand the job that they have. And that means understand the industry, they understand the impact of technology, where they are today and where their industry is likely to go tomorrow with regards to technology, and understand their business model, and understand the challenges for their specific stage of business. I've mentioned this a couple of times before, but there are five different stages of business and the job of the leader of the business is much different in each one of those stages of business. Those stages of business include startup mode, turnaround mode, rapid expansion mode, steady growth mode, and exit mode. And each one of those five different stages of business really represents an almost entirely completely different kind of business. So it's important for them to understand the job of today relative to the vision that they have for the business and the plans that they have for building their business. The next thing it's important for them to understand is the gaps. You know, everybody has gaps. Everybody has some areas of business in which they are very strong and other areas of business in which they are very weak. This is a common business foundation profile that I've seen after having done maybe 150 or so, is that people who start out in business are excellent at customer service and product development. They're okay at leadership and operations and maybe even okay at financial management. But a lot of people start in business without having any sales training or sales experience at all. And most people start in business without having any marketing experience whatsoever. Marketing experience is very difficult to get. In the last workshop that we did was on marketing itself. So I go into a lot of detail in that workshop on what it takes to be successful in marketing because that is one of the most critical aspects of business and almost universally the aspect of business that people are the weakest in. And curiously, I find that if somebody worked in a marketing department for a large company, they may be good at marketing for a large business, but they may not be good at marketing for small businesses at all. And typically, they're even worse at sales than people who don't have any sales experience at all. So everybody has gaps. It's important for a business to understand from the outset what their gaps are relative to their plans. I often say the most important gaps that you have are the gaps that prevent you from executing the 90-day plan that you put into place because you have to be able to execute 90-day plans in order to be able to execute any long-range plans for your business. So it's important for you to really understand your gaps. And for most management consultants, business consultants, the gap analysis is one of the initial things that we do for our clients into helping them discover those gaps so they can create detailed plans to close those gaps and actually achieve what it is that they want to achieve. Business owners need to get training and education to close their gaps, to leverage their strengths, and in all areas of business, but especially sales and marketing and financial management. Now, I'm a big fan of foundational education across all the different key performance areas of business. I want people to know what it means to be competent in financial management, to be competent in operations and administration and customer service. But the big three areas where I think that people most often need very specific training are in sales and in marketing and in financial management. The good news is that they can outsource a lot of the marketing activities if they find a good marketing consultant or contractor who will actually help them establish their brand, get them positioned in the marketplace, 
develop their marketing messages, develop and execute their marketing campaigns, develop all of their logos, etc. You can outsource marketing. You can also outsource financial management to bookkeepers and part-time CFOs, people that will actually do the numbers for you, run the books, run the financial statements, and then talk to you about the results that they see. But sales is different. No CEO of a business, no business owner can successfully outsource or delegate sales opportunities. Mostly because when you're dealing with really large customers, they want to talk to the CEO. They want to talk to the principal at the business and they really have to control that. So if you are new to your business or if you are thinking about going into business, understand that you have to be good at sales. There is no choice. Um, if you're not going to be good at sales, my, the odds of you being successful in your business are extremely poor. You have to get good sales education and you have to get good sales training in order to be successful in business. As we talked about before, it's really important for you to get a great team for your business. And in the outset, that usually means great admin support, great financial management support, and great legal support. And as we talked about earlier, great marketing support too. Again, if you go into business thinking that you're going to be a solopreneur, you're almost doomed to failure. You have to go into it with a teamwork at attitude, with a team mentality of knowing that it takes a team to be successful in business and understanding your gaps and finding quality team members to support you in the business. And speaking of support, it's really important for you to get support from the very outset. You need a great onboarding process having heavy mentoring during the first six months of business, and ideally having a champion at some of the major companies with which you want to do business. Finding somebody on the inside who will help you make successful proposals, who will help you be successful and become a quality supplier to them. They are incented to have quality veteran suppliers on their team, government regulations and and, and really kind of the spirit of doing business in America requires them to do business with veterans. So they're incentivized to help you be successful. And I would encourage you to find a champion. And if you work for one of those businesses, I would encourage you to be a champion as well. And the last one is staying focused. You really do need periodic reviews and adjustments to your plan. You need great coaching and mentoring in order to be able to stay focused on the plans that you create. As I've said in many of my presentations, execution is 95% of success. You can have a great vision, you can have a great plan, you can gather all of the resources you need and the team around you that you need to be successful, but unless you're able to execute day after day after day to pick up the phone and make those phone calls, to get out on the job site and do quality work, you're not gonna be successful. So doing everything that you can to make sure that you stay focused and that you execute well is essential to your business success. I am absolutely convinced that foundational training and business success principles and mentoring will help veterans be better suppliers, whether they're thinking about starting a business or if they've been in a business for a short time and they're struggling, or even if they've been in business for a long time and they want to accelerate their growth. That's the end of our presentation today. We're going to take a little break now and answer a few more questions before we wrap it all up. Um, and I see that we have a few questions when it comes to the second half of this, or what do we do about addressing the challenges of business? Here's the first question. How detailed do my plans have to be? That is kind of a tough question. And it really does depend on where you are in business and how big your business is. Generally speaking, the larger your business, the more detailed your plans have to be because you need to push those plans down to other people and have other people actually execute the tasks on those plans. If your plans are too detailed, you may find that there's no place for inspiration and flexibility. And if there's too little planning, you might find yourself shooting from the hip and really not thinking it through. You know, there's a, there are different mentalities of business owners. Some of them have an analytical planning approach. They really want to know step by step by step, how am I going to get from point A to point B? And other people are really kind of shoot from the hip people. So this is a question of, kind of your personality and your mindset as well. If you're a shoot from the hip person, you know, having a plan may actually hold you back. 
If you're an analytical person, having a plan is critical for you to take any action whatever. You're not even going to you know, step out of your door in the morning before you have a plan for the day. It really does depend on your personality, the size of the business, and where you are in the business. And of course, my good advice is usually to get somebody that can help you create that plan if you have a question about whether or not your plans are detailed enough. Next question is, how do I get clear on my business model? That is a very good question because I find a lot of people go into business and they don't even understand what the business model is. For example, I worked with a lady, you know, 10 years or so ago who said she wanted to open up a restaurant, but she'd never even worked in a restaurant. So when I talked to her about the importance of location and menu and service and decor and about how one third of your cost is in labor and one third of your cost is in the food products themselves and one third of your cost is in the facilities and, and the utilities around that, you know, that was really news to her. She really didn't understand the business at all. So one of the ways you get very clear on the business model is to work with somebody else who is in the business that you want to start for a while and to ask them questions, to be open with them about, hey, will you mentor me? Can I be your apprentice? Will you tell me how to run a business? Because it's my intention in two, three, or five years to run a complementary business to yours. You know, I want to start and grow my own business. And you will find people who love to do that. You know, they love to be a mentor to somebody. They like to give somebody the education and experience that they need to be successful running their own business and then to have a complimentary business with them. You can also ask accountants and business consultants because they've seen a lot of businesses. Accountants will know in general what your cost profiles should be and what other businesses similar to yours in your particular industry have spent on marketing and on their staff and on payroll taxes and what sort of margins you should be looking for in your business, what your gross profit should be, what your break even should be. So asking your accountants and asking your business consultants to check your business model is a really smart thing to do, to understand how much you can pay people relative to the revenue that they bring in, to understand how much you, return on investment you should get from your marketing campaigns and how much you should be spending on insurance and health care and all of the other different miscellaneous expense items of business is really, really important. So ask people and or get that experience yourself. Here's another question on uh, why don't people get the support that they need? And I think that there's really two reasons for that. Number one is they don't perceive the return on investment. They think if I do it all myself, I will save money. What they don't realize is that they're losing time when they're doing it by themselves. So you know, I've run a lot of different models for people that says, you know, if you were going from you know, no revenue to $10,000 a month in revenue, and it takes you 10 months to get there on your own, it's far better to spend $5,000 with a consultant who can help you get there in three months by working with them together. You achieved your goals quicker, and in the end, that $5,000 investment pays off a tremendous amount because you would have about six months of $10,000 in revenue or gained $60,000 in additional revenue and had a lot easier time at work for that $5,000 investment. So people don't spend the money because they don't perceive the ROI and they don't want to take the risk of having a bad investment. And there is, by the way, a lot of risk out there because business itself is risky. You don't know how the market's going to respond. You don't know how your particular experience and education is going to line up to the challenges in your business. So there is some risk, but generally they don't, they don't perceive the return on investment and the value of getting the support that they need. So they don't want to spend those dollars. They would rather just do it by themselves. And oftentimes that brings me to the second reason is that they have deep in their mind this concept of entrepreneur as hero, as the one who set out on their own with nothing but a slingshot and a lot of courage and determination and slew the mighty dragon and overcome all of the challenges and went back into the village and was hailed to be a tremendous hero and was appointed king and lived in wealth and harmony for the rest of their lives. Well, you know, occasionally we see people like Mark Zuckerberg and like um, Larry Ellison of Oracle Corporation 
and other people who do success, successfully start zillion dollar businesses, but that's extremely rare. Here in Silicon Valley, I say that it, only about one out of a thousand businesses or so that goes to seek capital and start a business actually creates a successful business where there's a successful exit and the investors get their monies back. Only about one in a hundred of them actually get funded. Only about one in a thousand of them are actually successful and only about one in 10,000 or less actually becomes that unicorn that's privately owned that has a billion dollar valuation. So entrepreneur as hero is a false concept that we teach in our society. I would much rather teach the concept of entrepreneur as leader of a successful team as opposed to somebody thinking that they're going to be the hero and going to be, you know, going to be rewarded handsomely and honored and appreciated for the fact that they created this business on your own. That's almost a sure path to failure. And last question is what can companies who hire veterans do to support their suppliers? We've kind of hinted at that throughout this presentation today. But it's workshops and boot camps. It's giving them the training and the education that they need to be successful. You might do a planning session every quarter where you invite all your suppliers in to work with a consultant to develop next quarter's plans. You might actually help them form success teams so that they can work with each other to to be, help each other be successful if they're not competitive in some different ways. And providing mentoring and coaching. I said earlier that I would like to see every bet veteran business have a champion at every company with which they do business. Somebody at that company who is heavily motivated to help that supplier become a quality supplier to their business. I think there's a lot that companies who hire veterans can do to help those veterans be successful. I think there's a lot that veterans can do in order to help themselves be successful in business. So that's the end of our workshop today. I want to thank you very much for your kind attendance. Again, thanks to our sponsors, Comcast, the City of San Jose, International Line Builders, California Department of General Services, the California Water Association, AT&T, and the nationwide network of elite SDVOB owners. Um, we'll see you next time on our workshop. This is Paul Hoyt saying thank you very much. If there's anything that we can do to help you be successful in business, any training, education, or other services, we'd love to have the opportunity to talk to you about that. Please reach out and let's have a conversation. Thank you again. Goodbye.